Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>
on Health, Employment, Labor, and Pensions will come to order. Welcome, everyone. I note that a quorum is present. I note for the subcommittee that Congressman Dan Kildee of Michigan, Congresswoman Abby Fickenauer of Iowa, Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick of Pennsylvania, and Congressman Ben Klein of Virginia will be participating in today's hearing with the understanding that their questions will come only after all members of the HELP subcommittee and any members of the full committee on both sides of the aisle who are present have had an opportunity to question the witnesses. The subcommittee is meeting today in a legislative hearing to receive testimony on standing with public servants protecting the right to organize. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7C, opening statements are limited to the chair and the ranking member. This allows us to hear from our witnesses sooner and provides all members with adequate time to ask questions. I recognize myself now for the purpose of making an opening statement. Today, we are gathered for a legislative hearing to receive testimony on the status of public sector collective bargaining and the legislative proposals which ensure state and local government employees can exercise this right. Labor unions have empowered generations of workers to secure better wages and working conditions. They have been essential to reducing income inequality. Collective bargaining agreements are especially important in closing the gender and racial wage gaps because labor agreements ensure equal pay for comparably situated and educated individuals in the workplace. Based upon personal experience, I know the benefits unions provide for public employees. When I was a teacher in the Miami-Dade County Public School System, I was also a member of the United Teachers of Dade Union. So I was very, very disappointed to see Florida pass HB 7055, which singles out teachers' unions, forcing them to conduct unnecessary elections in an effort to weaken teachers' ability to advocate for themselves. Public sector union benefits also extend beyond union members to benefit non-union members. Research shows that since the 1930s, workers' ability to unionize has corresponded to lower income inequality. Despite these widely enjoyed benefits, the federal government does not ensure state and local government employees consistent organizing rights nationwide. What we do know is that as many as half of all non-union workers would vote for a union if given the opportunity. As our witnesses will testify, state and local government employees face an inconsistent patchwork of state labor laws which leaves far too many public servants behind. And in fact, four states lack any regulation for public employees organizing rights, and many more have lackluster collective bargaining regulations which do not compel employers to negotiate with employees. To make matters worse, Worse, last year in the Janus versus AFSCME decision, the Supreme Court ignored four decades of legal precedent and 23 state laws to sabotage public sector unions. The Janus decision denies unions the right to collect fair share fees for services as they are legally required to provide, which fundamentally undermines public service workers' ability to collectively bargain. Congress has both the power and responsibility to protect the organizing <clears throat> and collective bargaining rights of all workers, no matter where they live or work. This Congress, two bills have been introduced. The Public Service Freedom to Negotiate Act of 2019, H.R. 3463, and the Public Safety Employer Employee Cooperation Act, H.R. 1154, that will improve the lives of public sector employees 
employed at the state and local levels. One legislative proposal that helps to protect public servants is the Public Service Freedom to Negotiate Act of 2019, which guarantees public employees the right to negotiate and unionize for better working conditions. Specifically, the bill will create minimum standards for collective bargaining rights that all states must meet while ensuring that states have flexibility in how that goal is effectuated. While the Public Service Freedom to Negotiate Act of 2019 <coughs> excuse me, cannot correct the Supreme Court's misreading of the Constitution in Janus, it can lessen the consequences by strengthening the rights of public service workers. While the Public Service Freedom to Negotiate Act, another bill that will help public servants is the Public Service Employer Employee Cooperation Act, which similarly protects first responders' right to organize by setting minimum standards for collective bargaining. On June 20, 2007, on June 20, 2007, this bill was reported out of this committee by a vote of 42 to 1. Let me repeat, this bill was reported out of the Education and Labor Committee by a vote of 42 to 1. Then ranking member Buck McKeon, whose portrait hangs on the wall to my right, supported this legislation. And when this bill came to the floor on July 17, 2007, it was considered under suspension of rules and passed by a vote of 314 to 97. Let me restate that point. It came to the floor with broad bipartisan support and it was deemed non-controversial and it passed with the support of over two-thirds of the House of Representatives. This historical note is important because it reinforces the fact that backing up public employees' right to collectively bargain has been a bipartisan endeavor in the not too distant past. These two bills reflect our commitment to ensuring that teachers can earn decent pay, police officers and firefighters are compensated for their service, and public service workers can continue to fulfill their vital roles in communities across the country. The people who keep our community safe, teach our children, and risk their lives to save ours deserve the same respect and protections as those employed in private industry. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and the discussion that will ensue. I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Wahlberg, for an opening statement. Mr. Wahlberg, the esteemed Mr. Wahlberg, our ranking member. Well, thank you, my friend and uh, chairwoman, uh, for yielding to me on this beautiful day. And those in the audience don't have the opportunity unless you turn your head to see how beautiful it is around Washington, D.C. And as we get into uh, this uh, debate, I hope we remember that uh, things are still pretty good. But this is a debate worth having. The two pieces of legislation we're here to discuss today are, I believe, in another Democrat attempt to put the thumb on the scale in favor of forced unionization, and they also show no regard for the system of federalism on which this nation was funded, founded. Um, H.R. 1154, the Public Safety Employer Employee Cooperation Act, and the Public Service Freedom to Negotiate Act disregard the will of the voters in every state by imposing a one-size-fits-all labor relations mandate enforced by federal bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. If there's one thing this country doesn't need, it's more federal overreach. We can be better than that, and as policymakers, shame on us if we're not. The Founding Fathers spent countless critical hours in debate, and they did debate deliberating a system of checks and balances that would ensure that individual states were not unreasonably controlled by the federal government. That's our foundation. 
Today, states have legitimate concerns with public sector collective bargaining, which is why even union-dominated states place some limitations on this practice. Rather than impose its will on individual states, Congress should respect these differences of opinion among the states and allow them to remain laboratories, as it were, especially as we talk about education and labor, laboratories of democracy in determining their own public employee labor law. We should all know by now that government unions create perverse incentives that do not exist in the private sector. They can't exist in the private sector. Government unions are enormously powerful political force. While all Americans are free to join together and should be, this side of the aisle would not reject that. Free to join together and engage in the political process, government unions can essentially elect their own employer. In other words, governors and state and local lawmakers with whom they negotiate collective bargaining agreements. These practices often force exorbitant, uh, uh, seemingly unlimited cost on the taxpayers, the people who pay the bill and expect the service. An unfortunate circumstance which is markedly different than negotiating with companies over the use of inherently limited profits as private sector unions do. Moreover, when government unions strike, it imposes undeserved hardship on the American people, the people we serve, allegedly. By depriving basic public services, they expect and they paid for in their taxes from state or local government. It is for these reasons that historically uh, lawmakers on both ends of the spectrum have steered clear of instituting collective bargaining in government. Even President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and George Meany, former president of the AFL-CIO, opposed collective bargaining in government. That's historic. Imposing collective bargaining on state and local governments will likely result in a massive unfunded mandate on taxpayers. Congress should therefore appropriately leave these decisions to states as our predecessors have done. Not only do these bills undermine our nation's system of federalism, they are another attempt by committee Democrats to advance union special interests at the expense of workers. Democrats' top labor priority is H.R. 2474, the Protecting the Right to Organize Act or the PRO Act, which deprives private sector workers of important workplace rights while giving labor unions almost unlimited power to impose economic harm on unsuspecting businesses. I bring up H.R. 2474 not only to demonstrate where committee Democrats' priorities lie, I believe, but also to show that the goal of the Democrats is to promote forced unionization throughout both the public and private uh, sectors. Exactly one year ago, the Supreme Court in Janus versus AFSCME ruled that no public employee should be forced to pay union dues as a condition of employment. I believe they ruled constitutionally. Forced dues in government are particularly egregious because collective bargaining impacts public policy and is thus inherently political speech. Rather than undermine these rights for public and private sector workers alike, this committee should focus on issues where we actually have jurisdiction, including protecting the rights of workers covered by the National Labor Relations Act. Private sector workers should be allowed to make workplace decisions for themselves, like the choice to join and pay a union or not, share personal information with a union organizer, or vote for a union in a secret ballot election. At the same time, states should be free to determine public employee labor laws for themselves without needless intervention from the federal government. 
This I believe strongly. And this, uh, Madam Chairwoman, we will debate today. It's a good debate. And I thank you for uh, uh, allowing me this opportunity, and I yield back. Without objection. <clears throat> All other members who wish to insert written statements into the record may do so by submitting them to the committee clerk electronically in Microsoft Word format by 5 o'clock p.m. on July 9, 2019. I will now introduce the witnesses. Ms. Tina Whitaker, Ms. Tina, is a social studies teacher from Miami, Florida. I'm so pleased to see Ms. Tina Whitaker on today's panel because she's a current public school teacher in Miami-Dade County, my hometown, and a member of the United Teachers of Dade. I was glad she was able to accept my invitation to testify today. I also want to welcome Ms. Carter Hernandez, who is the president of the United Teachers of Dade County. She's with us in the audience. Our next witness is Dr. Joseph Slater. He is the Eugene N. Balk Professor of Law and Values at the University of Toledo School of Law. Welcome. Mr. Bob Older is a state senator from Missouri, representing Missouri's District 2. Thank you for coming. Mr. Tom Brewer is the president of the Professional Firefighters and Paramedics of North Carolina in Charlotte, North Carolina. Mr. Brewer, thank you. Mr. William Messenger is an attorney with the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation in Springfield, Virginia. Welcome. Mr. Tig Patterson is the Deputy General Counsel of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees in Washington, D.C. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate all of the witnesses for being here today, and we look forward to your testimony. Let me remind the witnesses that we have read your written statements, and they will appear in full in the hearing record. Pursuant to committee rule and committee practice, each of you is asked to limit your oral presentation to a five-minute summary of your written statement. Let me also remind the witnesses that pursuant to Title 18 of the U.S. Code, Section 101, it is illegal to knowingly and willfully falsify any statement, representation, writing, document or material fact presented to Congress or otherwise conceal or cover up a material fact. Before you begin your testimony, please remember to press the button on the microphone in front of you so that it will turn on and the members can hear you. As you begin to speak, the light in front of you will turn green. After four minutes, the light will then turn yellow to signal that you have one minute remaining. When the light turns red, your five minutes have expired, and we ask that you please wrap it up so I won't have to gavel you, because I will. <laughs> we will let the entire panel make their presentations before we move to member questions. Remember, when answering a question, Please remember to once again turn your microphone on. I will first recognize Ms. Whitaker. Good morning, Chairman Scott and Ranking Member Fox. I would like to thank Chairwoman Wilson and Ranking Member Wahlberg for the opportunity to testify before this subcommittee. My name is Tina Whitaker. I'm a veteran teacher of 21 years in Miami-Dade County Public Schools, Florida, and a proud member of United Teachers of Dade. I teach social studies at Arthur and Polly Mays 6-12 Conservatory of the Arts. I began my teaching career in May 1995 as a substitute teacher in Scotland Neck, North Carolina at Brawley Middle School. Scotland Neck is in Halifax County, North Carolina, and is currently ranked 90th in per capita income in the state. I was excited not only was I giving back to the community in which I was raised, 
but I had the opportunity to work with teachers who had nurtured me as a student. At the beginning of the following school year, I began teaching North Carolina history and language arts to seventh graders. Still excited, I decorated my class for the new adventure with the help of those same teachers who were now my mentors. After the completion of a successful year, unfortunately, I was released from my teaching duties because I was told that I had not fulfilled my obligation of getting my certification within two years of employment. A month of being a substitute teacher and one full year does not calculate to working for two years, but I had no one to advocate on my behalf since there was not a union I could belong to in North Carolina. I realized that I would have to navigate those waters alone. I drove to Raleigh, North Carolina and pleaded my case to the North Carolina Department of Education. With hope in my heart, I proceeded to go back to the, to the Human Resources Department in, at, Halifax, at the Halifax County School Board. I had no one to advocate on my behalf. I had no union, no professional organization that could fight for me. Here I was, a product of the community and the county school system who had beat the odds, but could not get anyone to listen to my pleas. I wanted the students that lived in my community to see that you can go off to college, get your degree, and come back home and serve the community in which you lived. I went from sadness and embarrassment to anger. I was angry because I was let go unfairly, and those who could help me did not. I was, I was able eventually to find an educational lawyer that took my case pro bono. Months later, I moved to Miami, Florida and started the process of gaining employment as a substitute teacher and eventually an educator in Miami-Dade County Public School System. From my experiences in North Carolina, I learned what happens when you don't have someone to advocate for you. Therefore, I did not hesitate to join UTD after I became a teacher. This union has helped me reach my full potential. After coming from a place where my dreams were stifled and where I was unable to help my community, I found my voice in Miami because of a union that has helped me not only become a better educator, but a better professional. UTD has afforded me opportunities that I otherwise would not have had. The PDF taken part in has given me tools, provided that I was chosen as Teacher of the Year and Social Studies Teacher of the Year. We're not just a union within the walls of our school building. We participate in advocacy and activism. With all that we do in our community, we have still had to organize to combat adverse, bad legislation that adversely affects our student and our workforce. Yes, bad legislation does trickle down into our classrooms. When bad legislation is passed, it affects the morale, the district funding, which provide for smaller classes, more mental and educational services, and teacher salaries. You must walk your talk. Your message must be a one of bringing togetherness in our communities. Healthy workforces and bargaining capability build strong and active communities, and strong communities build stronger ec economies. I am Tina Whitaker, and as a proud public school teacher and union member, I want public school teachers around the country to have a right to collectively bargain. I hope that Congress will soon pass this important legislation. Again, thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Whitaker. We'll now recognize Dr. Slater. Madam Chair Wilson, Ranking Member Wahlberg, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Joseph Slater. I am a distinguished university professor at the University of Toledo, and I'm here to give some background about how public sector labor laws work and have worked in the U.S. and explain why I support the Public Service Freedom to Negotiate Act and the Public Safety Employer Employee Cooperation Act. 
First, the U.S. is very different than other comparable countries. In other industrialized nations, public sector unions and private sector unions have essentially the same rights. In the U.S., while private sector workers won the right to bargain collectively in 1935 with the National Labor Relations Act, public sector unions did not begin to win collective bargaining rights until the 1960s. And even today, eight states do not permit any public employees to bargain collectively, and about another 12 states only allow one to two types of public employees to bargain collectively. Meanwhile, international law views collective bargaining as a fundamental human right. Second, public sector labor law is out of step with other employment laws in the U.S. Many employment laws, many federal employment laws in the U.S. cover public employees as well as private employees. The wages and working conditions of public employees affect commerce, which is why Congress has the power, for example, to apply the Fair Labor Standards Act to public employees as well as private employees. Third, objections to public sector collective bargaining have been largely disproven by experience. One old objection was that public officials would, for political reasons, cave to union demands. Experience has shown that's not true. This is partly because there are strong political pressures to the contrary. The general public wants good public services, but it also wants low costs for those services. And at the voting booth, the general public tends to swamp public employees. There are also powerful and well-funded groups opposing public employee interests, such as anti-tax groups and anti-union groups. Um, meanwhile, public employees have legitimate interests as employees, just as private employees do, that need protection. Further, public sector collective bargaining rights generally do not have any significant, significant impact, negative impact on public budgets. Public employees are not overpaid compared to comparable private sector workers. The vast majority of studies on the issue have shown that, if anything, public employees are paid somewhat less than their comparable private sector counterparts. Relatedly, there's no correlation between state budget deficits and states that grant collective bargaining rights to public employees. Researchers from UC Berkeley found, quote, no statistically significant correlation between union density, union strength, and the size of state budgets. As Congressman Mike Quigley once observed, states allowing a public sector collective bargaining on average have a 14% budget deficit, while states that bar collective bargaining have on average a 16.5% deficit. Fourth, public sector collective bargaining laws do a lot of good. They promote labor peace, reducing the number of illegal public sector strikes. When my state of Ohio passed its public sector law in the early 80s, the number of strikes in the public sector decreased dramatically. This was despite the fact that the Ohio law not only allowed collective bargaining rights for public employees, but it allowed some public employees to strike under some circumstances. But yet, the number of strikes went down. The same thing happened when Illinois passed its collective bargaining law in the 1980s. The reason this happens is because giving bargaining rights to workers and effective alternatives to strikes means workers don't have to use illegal strikes as their only option to address their concerns. Indeed, a leading study found that public sector strikes were most likely to occur in states that did not allow collective bargaining for public employees. For example, the teacher strikes in 2018 took place in six states, none of which permitted collective bargaining by teachers. Fifth, collective bargaining rights help with retention and recruitment of employees. We should encourage talented people to go into the public service and stay there. Opponents of collective bargaining rights of unions often make arguments about corporate executive pay along the lines of, well, you need to pay these people a lot of money to get good people in the jobs and keep them there. Well, that's also true. We need to have good pay and benefits if we want talented people in the public service, if we want good teachers, firefighters, and police officers. Sixth, a number of studies show that unions increase efficiency and productivity. This is because union members know how to do their jobs. A series of studies demonstrate that. Finally, unions help the economy as a whole, in part because they help bolster the middle class. Um, collective bargaining has historically served to increase consumer purchasing power, assure voice in the workforce, and provide checks and balances in society. For these reasons, I support the Public Service Freedom to Negotiate Act. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Slater. We will now recognize Mr. Onder, mm -hmm. Thank uh, you. state senator. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Chairwoman Wilson, Ranking Member Wahlberg, members of the committee, uh, for the record, I am Bob Onder, State Senator representing Missouri's second senatorial district. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I was elected to the Missouri Senate in 2014, and since then I have chaired the committee that has handled most of Missouri's labor bills, including Missouri's Government Worker Protection Act, House Bill 1413, uh, a comprehensive labor reform bill signed into law last year. Uh, today I appear before you to testify in favor of the rights of states and their political subdivisions to set their own public sector labor policies, and as such, I testify in opposition to the two bills before you today. Private sector collective bargaining has been governed by federal law since President Franklin Roosevelt signed the Wagner Act in 1935. Congress has long recognized the distinction between public sector collective bargaining and the private sector, and has allowed states and local governments accordingly to set their own laws, their own policies in the latter. FDR himself recognized this distinction when he stated, all government employees should recognize that the process of collective bargaining, as usually understood, cannot be transplanted into the public service. It is important to recognize, as did your predecessors, the fundamental differences between government and private sector unions. In the private sector, employers are private companies or individuals. Government, and by extension, the people are the employers of public sector employees. Government unions through aggressive political activity often end up electing their own bosses, potentially leading to conflicts between the interests of citizens and taxpayers and that of the unions. In the private sector, there are natural checks and balances on the power of unions. If union demands make a company uncompetitive, everyone suffers, witness the US auto industry. These checks and balances are lacking with government unions. If we, if we look at states with the worst fiscal conditions and the highest taxes, such as Illinois, New Jersey, Connecticut, what they all have in common is very strong government unions. I believe that if there's one thing we can agree on here, it is that different states have very different approaches to labor policy. For example, whether collective bargaining is allowed for police, firefighters, and teachers, most allow it, some mandate it, some ban it, and some allow it to be decided at the local level and whether these workers should be allowed to strike. These varying uh, policies have evolved over decades. Missouri has allowed public sector collective bargaining since 1965, and since then the policy has been modified from time to time by statute, by decisions by, of two government agencies, and by hundreds of political subdivisions. Congress has no business centralizing all of this power in the Federal Labor Relations Authority. It would be an enormous federal overreach and a violation of the principle of federalism to do so. And it would also require a massive exp expansion of the Federal Labor Relations Authority to micromanage labor policy in 50 states and thousands of political subdivisions across our country. Finally, federalization of public sector labor law would preclude reform measures that protect both workers and taxpayers. Examples of such reforms include the provisions of House Bill 1413 passed in Missouri last year. With this bill, we, we codified the certification process. We gave workers the right to vote every three years as to whether they wanted to continue to be represented by a union, gave the workers the right to annually opt in or out of financial payment to unions, and promoted financial transparency similar to federal LM reporting these protections would be nullified by federal legislation. Alexander Hamilton wrote in Federalist 9 that the proposed constitution leaves to states possession certain exclusive and very important portions of sovereign power. Our current system of state control of public sector labor relations allows states to use that sovereign power to balance the interests of public employees and unions, citizens, and taxpayers. I urge this committee to reject federal takeover of these very important state functions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Onder. We will now recognize Mr. Brewer. Good morning, Chairman, Chairwoman Wilson, Ranking Member Wahlberg, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Tom Brewer, 
and I am the president of the Professional Firefighters and Paramedics of North Carolina. I appear before you today on behalf of the International Association of Firefighters, our General President Harold Schaeberger, and the over 316,000 professional firefighters and emergency medical personnel who comprise our union. I began my career in public service nearly 23 years ago, and today I serve the citizens of Charlotte, North Carolina as a frontline firefighter and captain. I also serve as my president of my local union, IAFF Local 660. My coworkers and I strive every day to protect our community and its citizens. At its core, the right to organize and collectively bargain is about establishing a mechanism to enable labor and management to work together for their mutual benefit. In states and localities with strong laws, collective bargaining has produced measurable improvements in training, staffing, equipment, and health and safety, resulting in improved local emergency response capabilities, safer communities, and safer firefighters. The people that we serve expect the very best from their firefighters, and we work hard every day to meet these expectations. But many times we are being asked to do our jobs with one hand tied behind our backs, because even as highly trained experts, we cannot consistently convey basic workplace needs to our employers. Today's fire service operates on multiple governmental levels. Firefighters regularly respond beyond their own jurisdictions to incidents involving hazardous materials, active shooters, wildland fires, and other local and national security threats, all of which can impact communities not just throughout a state, but across a region. Fire departments must work together in partnership to meet, tr meet threats facing communities. Without an effective local response, homeland security is almost inevitably impaired. The federal government, therefore, has a responsibility to ensure that emergency response at the local level is as effective as possible. As public sector workers, we are banned in my home state from collective bargaining. This means we cannot meet with our employer in a good faith structured exchange. Instead, we plead with our local governments to try and get what we need to do our jobs effectively. As a result, both workers and community experience inadequate protections. There are many communities in North Carolina where fire apparatus are dangerously understaffed. When responding to a fire, they must literally wait until a second apparatus arrives before engaging in suppression activities. Understaffing also hinders responses to other incidents such as car accidents, where insufficient personnel slows extrication duties and life-saving procedures such as CPR. This not only, not only endangers firefighters, but it puts citizens at risk. Time and time again, firefighters in these communities have asked their city councils to increase staffing to meet these necessary safety standards, and time and time again, they have been shut out. With collective bargaining, both parties would have a structured process that would allow for this necessary conversation to occur, helping fix this serious public safety problem. Consider my hometown of Charlotte. For the past 20 years, we have pleaded with, city to, with the city to provide us with firefighter physicals, including cancer screenings. Finally, after years of dead-end requests, the city relented, and this is the first year they are being administered. Had we been able to sit down with our employer and present our case, how many dollars, and more importantly, how many lives may have been saved? Thankfully, there is a solution. The Public Safety Employer-Employee Cooperation Act will provide a basic set of collective bargaining rights for firefighters and other public safety workers while protecting the rights of states that currently provide these protections. Collective, bargain, collective bargaining is overwhelmingly used as a mechanism to enable labor and management to work together for their mutual benefit. The Cooperation Act represents a conversation between public safety employers and employees a process, not an outcome. Nowhere is this relationship more important than when lives and property are at stake. Having a voice in the workplace is a fundamental right for firefighters, just as the public has a fundamental right to rely on effective emergency services. In conclusion, when workers have a meaningful role and effective voice in the decision-making process, everyone is better off. Firefighters are safer and communities are safer. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Brewer. We will now recognize Mr. Messenger. Chairwoman Wilson, Ranking Member Wahlberg, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I practice labor and constitutional law for the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation, advocating for individual employees in both the private sector and the public sector, and that includes representing Mark Janis, 
in his case, Janus versus AFSCME, before the U.S. Supreme Court. In Janus, the Supreme Court held it was unconstitutional under the First Amendment for the government to compel employees to subsidize a union's speech without their consent. As a result of Janus, an estimated 5 million public employees were freed from forced fee requirements and now have the right to choose whether or not to support a union. But while public sector workers now enjoy this freedom, many private sector workers do not. And in particular, those private sector workers not fortunate enough to work in the nation's 27 right-to-work states can still be forced to support a union against their will, even though their public sector brethren cannot. Now, this inequity can be rectified by Congress passing a National Right-to-Work Act, which would extend right-to-work protections to all employees. With the National Right-to-Work Act, both public sector employees and private sector employees would enjoy the freedom to choose whether to support a union. Unfortunately, some propose to make an equitable situation even worse by stripping private sector employees who enjoy right-to-work protections of those protections. A prime example is the Protecting the Right to Organize Act, H.R. 2474, which would permit unions to force private sector workers to pay compulsory fees, notwithstanding state right-to-work laws to the contrary. That act represents a step backwards. In the wake of Congress, Congress should seek to expand worker freedoms, not to curtail them. But while Janus freed public sector workers from forced fee requirements, many are still subject to forced representation requirements. Under monopoly bargaining laws, workers are required to accept a union as their exclusive representative for speaking and contracting with the government over certain public policies, irrespective of whether the individual employee approves or not. In other words, the government is dictating who speaks for employees in their relations with government. And as a result, the individual worker is stripped of his ability to speak for himself or through other associations of his or her choice. Now, the Supreme Court in Janus recognized that this form of government-compelled association substantially restricts non-members' rights and, quote, causes significant impingement on associational freedoms. And in fact, it turns the democratic process on its head. Under monopoly bargaining laws, instead of citizens choosing their representatives in government, the government is choosing representatives to speak for its citizens. Even Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who enacted the National Labor Relations Act, opposed public sector monopoly bargaining. So, but at a minimum, it is a monopoly bargaining is a fundamentally flawed idea that Congress should leave up to the states of whether or not they should politically collectivize uh, their own employees. Currently, state labor relations are governed not by federal law, but by state law. And some states, such as Virginia and North Carolina, do not allow monopoly bargaining at all. In several other states, after suffering the negative consequences of, hold, of uh, handing union officials too much artificial political power, have been moving to reform their laws. As these states are moving to correct the situation, Congress should stay out of the way and not make their job harder. <coughs> and in fact, the Tenth Amendment requires that Congress respect state sovereignty on this matter. Under the Tenth Amendment, the federal government cannot interfere with state governance by dictating both its states regiment their employees into mandatory advocacy groups and formulate their public policies based upon bargaining with those advocacy groups. Such interference with how states formulate their own public policies would violate basic principles of federalism and would not survive a legal challenge in the courts. Thank you for your opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Messenger. We will now recognize Mr. Patterson. Thank you. Chairwoman Wilson, members of the committee, my name is Teague Patterson. I am Je Deputy General Counsel for the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, or AFSCME. Uh, I want to thank Chairwoman Wilson and Ranking Member Walbert for this opportunity to testify at this hearing. I also thank Congressman Cartwright and Senator Hirono for sponsoring the Public Service Freedom to Negotiate Act, and also Chairman Scott and the many other members of this committee for co-sponsoring this important legislation. AFSCME members provide the vital services that make America happen. In major cities and in small towns across the United States, AFSCME members work in hundreds of occupations dedicated to serving the public, including in the fields of justice, education, healthcare, transportation, public works, and many, many others. Why do people, why do working people join unions? simply so that they can productively address their working conditions, gain economic security, and improve the work they do for their communities. Notably, low and middle wage workers 
gain the most from unions, reducing economic inequality and gender and racial wage gaps, while also providing a means to address other forms of discrimination faced by women, people of color, LGBTQ plus individuals, and the disabled. Public service unions also benefit communities. Union members use their collective voice to advocate for better public services, like ensuring that 911 call centers have the staff necessary to quickly answer calls and dispatch help, and also to make sure that schools hire staff necessary for students to succeed. Surveys and experience show that unions are more popular than ever, and when public employees have a meaningful right to bargain, they are choosing to express that right by forming and joining unions. It is, in fact, a right that's guaranteed by the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. This bill is needed because in many states and communities, public servants have been denied a meaningful opportunity to exercise this fundamental right. What's more, organized anti-union forces are working to further undermine unions, dismantling protections for public service workers who wish to exercise this important right. We've heard from some of them today. In fact, we just now heard from Mr. Onder regarding his bill in Missouri, HB 1413, which he described as a step forward. But this past month, in this past March, a Missouri judge issued an injunction halting that law. Here's, what the judge, here's how the judge described it, and I quote, a blatant attempt to subjugate employees to the whims and caprices of management free from the obligation to act in good faith. The judge also stated it renders collective bargaining, quote, a farce, and it also, quote, imp impermissibly reaches deep into the mechanics of self-governments and dictates the terms and circumstances under which unions are permitted to express their political voice and opinion. So it's laws like this in Missouri and other states that make this act necessary. The Public Service Freedom to Negotiate Act empowers the Federal Labor Relations Authority to protect the right of public service employees to join a union, to collectively bargain, to access dispute resolution mechanisms, and to be free from the imposition of rigged recertification elections. And it is drafted with the powers, rights, and limitations granted by the Constitution in mind. Private sector labor relations have been regulated under the NLRA for more than 80 years. Because public sector employer-employee relations affect commerce in the same way, and to the same degree as in the private sector, Congress assuredly has the authority to enact equivalent protections in the public sector. But this act does so in a way that ensures local control and does not go beyond the requirements of the Commerce Clause and is in keeping with principles of federalism. It guarantees that states can design their own solutions while completely exempting the smallest municipalities altogether. But for states that do not do that, it protects the rights of public service workers while providing a, a means to cooperatively and productively resolve disputes. In conclusion, this legislation will help level the playing field and ensure that dedicated public service employees can negotiate for fair wages, hours, and working conditions and improved public services for our communities. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. It is a privilege and honor to appear before this committee and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Patterson. And let me welcome again, all the way from Miami, Ms. Carla Hernandez-Matz, who is the president of the United Teachers of Dade. I'm so happy that she's with us today. Under Committee Rule 8A, we will now question witnesses under the five-minute rule. I will now yield myself five minutes. Ms. Whitaker, in 2018, Florida passed House Bill 2075, an education bill containing a thinly veiled attack on teacher unions. The law represents a 180 degree reversal of Florida's past 50 years of public sector collective bargaining law. In 1962, Florida interpreted its constitution to provide public employees with the right to join or refrain from joining an employee organization like a labor union without fear of losing their jobs. And in 1968, the Constitution was rewritten to explicitly include a protection for public employees' collective bargaining rights. 
However, as of 2018, this right is being eroded by requiring teacher unions to report their dues paying membership data to the state, data which is then being used to trigger elections if dues paying membership is less than 50%. This reform makes no sense, creates no solution to any problem, and instead burdens teachers and their unions with unnecessary regulations. In your testimony, you describe the impacts of bad legislation on teacher morale. How has HB 7055 impacted you and your colleagues, and how are you and other teachers resisting this targeted attack? Thank you, Chairman Wilson. In our school buildings, our teachers are constantly worrying about whether or not our rights and privileges will be taken away. Our morale is already low because of the attack from our legislature. And once they started with the decertification bill, now everyone is on edge. It has taken our union away from lobbying for our children with our school board, making sure that the items that they pass benefit all students and not just top management. Also, this legislation has provided a way to eventually take the union out of the process. Not too long ago, they took away tenure for teachers. How can you ensure that you have an operating education system if you don't have tenure for teachers. New teachers are now coming into the system and not knowing whether or not they have a job from year to year because each year they go back to being an annual contract teacher. So the morale has been very low. The funding has been low um, from our legislature and teachers and our union are now, we're constantly fighting that battle and it feels as if it's us against them, and that's not how it should be. We should be working together to resolve issues. Teachers should be at the table when legislation is proposed, and with United Teachers Update, they've been on the forefront because the teachers could not be there. We had to work. It was our responsibility to educate our children. That's what we're there for. And with our children in the buildings, they're worried now whether or not they're gonna have teachers from year to year because there is a major shortage in the state of Florida. Right now we're at 2,000. And if the teachers that are responsible are close to retirement, if they retire, that number will go higher. So that bill was basically put forth to further break United Teachers of Date, I feel. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Patterson, your testimony mentioned some of the inconsistencies within the gamut of state laws and govern, that govern public employees' collective bargaining. Um, some states, I want you to tell us how are these inconsistencies, um, how do they harm workers and why is there a need for a federal standard? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, look, some variation state by state is healthy, and, and, and we have that. Um, but the problem is where uh, states uh, do not provide for the effective or the meaningful exercise of the right to join a union and to collectively bargain uh, is where this bill becomes necessary. Um, in, in terms of establishing a basic floor, this bill establishes terms that have been shown to be tried and true and effective in ameliorating uh, disruptive activity and ensuring a cooperative and productive labor relations uh, uh, system. Thank you. I now recognize the ranking member Wahlberg for his round of questions, the esteemed ranking member. You flatter me. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I appreciate that and appreciate the panel being here today. As I said earlier, it, it is an important discussion. Uh, Mr. Messenger, uh, we would certainly together agree uh, that workers should have a right to secret ballot elections and should be free to decide for themselves whether to join and pay into a union or to share personal information with a union organizer or not. 
Uh, Democrats insist these basic protections threaten the right to organize. I, I don't see that. Um, uh, they indicate that it uh, threatens the protections uh, to, uh, to pro propose or deny all of them uh, legislative protection as well currently pending before this committee. Uh, however, uh, if at all, I guess I would ask you this question, do right to work secret ballot elections or employee privacy impact workers' rights to organize? And second, uh, why are these protections so important for workers? Thank you for the question. To answer them in reverse order, the reason they're so important is the First Amendment guarantees every individual the choice to choose with whom they associate. So the government shouldn't be in the business of forcing any individual to associate with a union or any other advocacy group against their will. And to the extent the government does decide to force individuals to submit to monopoly representation, at the very least, it should be done pursuant to a democratic process in which the uh, individuals are guaranteed the right to a secret ballot vote, where they can make their choice in the privacy of a voting booth, as opposed to uh, being forced to make that choice in the presence of a union organizer. And that goes to the second question with respect to giving out employees confidential information. Uh, the information that some of these bills uh, seek to uh, require disclosure of is personal to those employees. It's personal email addresses, personal phone numbers. It's a violation of that individual employee's privacy uh, to compel the disclosure of that information to a third party that that individual may not want anything to have to do with. And then when you couple them together with the disclosure of information and the lack of secret ballot protections, you're putting together a very coercive process. It takes away their choice. Um, Dr. Under, uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for the work you do in the Senate. Uh, thanks for will be willing to experience the impact of a judge and a court decision. Yes. Even as on the other side with Janice, there was a court decision. And yes. There's disagreement, of course. There's disagreement here, and we'll see how it all turns out. I personally hope it turns out well for you. As yes. a state legislator, we understand, at least we ought to, the primacy of the, of the states are what makes our federalism really work, and sadly we've moved away from that. Um, uh, the legislation that you pass requires public employers to receive annual authorization from employees before deducting union dues from their paychecks. Um, based on your experience, why do you think this paycheck protection provision is an important um, policy for workers? Yes, I think it's very important because workers not only make the decision whether to, to join or to opt out, out of the union, but they should be able to decide whether, whether they want, uh, whether they want uh, to, uh, their dues withheld or whether they want to opt out. And, and I think what happens all too often, we know that it, only 5%, fewer than 5% of Missouri government union workers have ever had a chance to vote on their union. These, were, these unions were certified as having monopoly control over workplaces decades ago. So regularly offering employees the option to continue to have dues withheld or to, or to potentially stop having dues withheld and, and, and leave union membership, I think that is a fundamental worker right as well as well as a right to periodically vote whether, whether that worker wants to continue monopoly representation by a given union in that workplace. You also, you also indicated in your legislation that uh, collective bargaining negotiations must be open to the public. Why is that important? Well, because the public has an interest in what goes on in those meetings. Public money is being spent, public policy is being made, right now in behind closed doors meetings. And uh, I noticed that one of these bills would actually um, actually exclude management from these negotiations and only give the final say to the governing board of that, leg of that political subdivision. So I think more transparency, um, more ability of the public to see how their money is being spent is important. Thank you, I uh, yield back. Mr. Morelli. Thank you, uh, Chairman Wilson, for uh, holding this important hearing. To all our witnesses for uh, being here today. In my district of uh, Rochester and throughout all of New York State, 
We've long stood behind our workers' right to organize and collectively bargain. We are a union state. We understand that a strong union means effective workplace safety, higher wages, reliable benefits, and improved quality of life for all of our employees. I saw the benefits firsthand while growing up in a union household. My dad was a proud member of the Plumbers and Pipefitters Union, Local 13, United Association, uh, and I worked to defend these rights throughout my 28 years as a member of the New York State Assembly serving uh, as uh, its majority leader. And I'm proud to be part of this subcommittee and the majority parties we fight to protect and promote strong labor standards and the rights our workers deserve. The Supreme Court's 2018 decision in Janus was yet another in a long history of attacks on labor unions in this country. And such decisions are consistent with the sentiments expressed by the Trump administration and what I believe is their steady campaign to undermine the ability of labor unions to collectively bargain and ensure strong labor standards, fair and livable wages, and better benefits for all employees. Uh, my home state was one of the first to respond to Janus um, in the court case to ensure our unions and workers um, knew the state was behind them and giving them full-throated support. Today's hearing, however, remains as imperative as ever. Employees in too many states across the country are robbed of the support by misleading right-to-work laws. It is our responsibility to continue the fight for workers' rights to organize and collectively bargain to ensure fair standards for all, including taxpayers. So I wanted to uh, uh, just ask, I think Mr. Patterson, I'd like your uh, perspective on this. In, in my opinion, the diverse and divergent legal regime that currently governs state and local employees' ability to collectively bargain and join a union is insufficient. And we have seen example after example of the poor outcomes that result from the prohibition of collective bargaining. I want to, uh, d given what the um, the ranking member, Mr. Wahlberg, said, and I've had some, uh, as I said, a long history as a state legislator. Um, why, in your opinion, does it fall to Congress to, uh, to create a minimum standard instead of what would what the, you think the best argument is instead of leaving it to uh, for essentially a state-by-state -state decision making? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, and, and the answer is really for the same reasons um, that 80 plus years ago Congress enacted the Wagner Act, which is that unstable labor relations where the right of, of, of workers who, uh, who organize to productively resolve their grievances and disputes and to negotiate over wage, wages, if they aren't given that productive opportunity, it overflows into the economy. The, the public sector is a, is a huge segment of the American economy. And we've seen uh, what happens when, when workers don't have a productive means of expressing that right. And we've seen a number of, of strikes in different states, and particularly in states that, that don't afford a meaningful right to bargain. So we see this kind of activity where, where there isn't a productive process to reach terms and conditions of employment. And so really it's for those, those same reasons that this bill is necessary. Very good, thank you. Mr. Brewer, I'm, I'm just um, curious. I often know that people who are rank and file workers who are those who come up with the most effective reforms about how to, um, uh, to do things more effectively, more efficiently in your department, for instance. How, how challenging is it for rank and file members to, um, to get their employers to consider those proposals, to really look at how do we improve the function of a fire department or a police department. Could you just talk about that and any experiences you might have had or that members have had? Absolutely, and uh, thank you very much. To put it just bluntly, it's incredibly difficult for employees to make suggestions and have their, their voices heard. Uh, in my testimony, I brought up the, I, I brought up the physicals. Uh, this is something that before I was even hired on the Charlotte Fire Department, our home local of Local 660 was advocating for um, annual firefighter physicals, which is kind of the industry standard. And uh, this went on for over 20 years before we finally got them. As part of these physicals, there were there were some cancer tests in there, cancer detection tests. Um, as a lot of you know, cancer has been a scourge in the fire service uh, from 2014 to 2016. In the Charlotte Fire Department alone, we had 41 documented cases of cancer. Uh, we had three firefighters die within a three-month period of time. And I'm not saying that these physicals would have caught them, but there's a, a great possibility that they would have. But if we would have had the means to simply sit down with our employer and say, hey, we want these physicals to protect our members to get these tests, it would have been a lot easier than having to go to politicians and asking them to do it. Very good. 
Madam Chair, thank you again for this hearing. I appreciate it very much, and I yield back my time. Thank you. And now, uh, the distinguished Dr. Rowe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, a full disclosure, I've served as a city commissioner and mayor of my local community before I was elected. And, and uh, Mr. Brewer, thank you for your service in the Air Force. I also want to, to thank the uh, Charlotte EMT folks. I found myself one morning in the floor of the Charlotte Airport doing CPR on a gentleman who had a cardiac arrest, and uh, they were able to come and assist, and this gentleman survived and did well. So. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I want to get uh, straight to um, some questions about the secret ballot. And um, I, by the way, I'm a huge fan, being a mayor, of our fire and police department. In Tennessee, where I am in our local community in Johnson City, we have an ASO rating of one. We do not have a, uh, we're not unionized there. And our police officers, uh, I, I had to put on a scrub suit to go to work every day. They had to put on a Kevlar vest. And I have in incredible respect and EMTs I worked with as a physician in my local community. Um, and I've seen that service improve dramatically across the country um, from, uh, from when I started the practice of medicine. So I wanted to say that personally. I have a very strong feeling. I put on a uniform and left this country uh, to go to Southeast Asia over 40 years ago to protect your right to have a secret ballot. I think it is one of the most sacrosanct rights we have in America is to be able to go behind a screen, and I say this as a joke, and people in here have heard it, I don't even know whether my wife votes for me or not because it's a secret ballot. And I think it's that important, and I found it hypocritical that when we developed the USMCA that we had people on this committee right here insist that part of the MCA agreement that uh, workers in Mexico had a right to a secret ballot, which I totally agree with, but we're trying to take that right away from an American citizen. I don't understand that. And I, I would like um, uh, anyone, uh, Mr. Patterson or anybody, to answer why you don't think a secret ballot is a good idea when I go to vote for me, every person on this dais was uh, elected by a secret ballot. Well, the, the act that's uh, under consideration does provide for secret ballots, and it also allows states where the, uh, to, to have laws which afford voluntary recognition on the basis of a majority showing of interest. So you would support it's, a secret ballot in, in union elections then? I, I, would, I would support employee free choice, choice if that free choice is exercised in a manner that's non-coercive and that meets the same requirements the way you that public a, elections the way you in have this a non country coercive, meet. The way it's non-coercive is you pull a curtain and you get to vote in a secret ballot. That's the way, and, and look, if you want to have a union, it's, it's a, you, you should be able to vote for it and have it if you want to, if not. Um, the, the people who are in that, and the other one, I'd like to have a question, Mr. Messenger, you may know this. What happened in, because I don't, what happened in Wisconsin when the laws were changed there um, and uh, uh, the governor there changed the law and there was a lot of turmoil about whether you had to pay or not to be in union. Did people opt out or did they stay in? Did they see value from their membership, I guess is what I'm asking. A large number of employees decided to drop out once they had the opportunity to actually make that choice. Uh, prior to Act 10 and it was also prior to Janus, you know, employees in Wisconsin didn't have a choice uh, of whether or not they wanted to support a union. Once they were given that choice, a large number decided to, to decide to opt out. Now, some decided to stay. That's also their free choice. But the most important thing is that each individual uh, was allowed to choose. Uh, and if I could also go back to answer your first question with respect to secret ballot elections, you know, another important part of a secret ballot is that the result is respected of that election. Under H.R. 2474, the PRO Act, gives the NLRB the authority, if employees vote against union representation, to overturn that result if the NLRB believes it doesn't reflect employee free choice and impose the union on those employees that they just rejected. And so I think that the PRO Act, you know, in that way, even though employees were given the right to vote, it means little if their voice isn't ultimately respected. Uh, Dr. Andre, and not only do states and local governments have ideological preferences, they also have unique needs when it comes to prioritization, budgeting, and as I know, and you know as a state legislator and other decisions governments make. Based on your experience as a legislator, why is flexibility important for state and local lawmakers, and what impact would the bills before us today have on the flexibility that state and local governments they currently enjoy to make important financial decisions? 
Yeah, it's the very essence of our system of democratic governance that we elect officials who then make decisions. We, but the people exercise their sovereignty through their elected officials. And when that sovereignty is replaced by behind closed door negotiations between politicians and union officials, that violates that sovereignty and that's very important. And I agree with you on secret ballots. Voluntary recognition with a, kind of a card check, voluntary showing of recognition, and of course those cards are obtained out in the open with a union organizer pressuring employees to sign them. That is the very antithesis of the principle of the secret ballot. Thank you, Madam Chair. You go back. Mr. Courtney of Connecticut. Thank, thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and, and thank you to all the witnesses uh, for being here today. Uh, Mr. Brewer, I just wanted to sort of footstomp a, a point you made in your uh, testimony about um, a, a practical uh, public benefit of c collective bargaining, which is the apparatus staffing that you described where only two uh, are, again, the, the system that you have uh, in, in the area that you're working. As, as a member of an international, I mean, you're obviously able to compare notes uh, with other jurisdictions that do have collective bargaining where issues like staffing actually are um, negotiated. And, um, and maybe you could just sort of describe that sort of side by side of, of you know, colleagues that are in uh, states that recognize collective bargaining and the benefits to the public of adequate staffing versus uh, non-union uh, jurisdictions like your own, where it, it sounds like you almost have to wait for another uh, vehicle or truck to show up before you can actually start doing your job. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you. And um, yeah, absolutely, we do have communities in North Carolina that are severely understaffed. Uh, places like Boone, North Carolina, for example, you know, where there's a major university, they'll have trucks with two individuals, with two firefighters on those trucks. Um, and it does, it can, it has the, you know, the possibility to hinder operations. Uh, studies show, for example, that four-person CPR is the most effective. Uh, when it comes to fighting fire, there's like a two-in, two-out rule. And, you know, if you show up with just two people on a, on a, on a apparatus and the house is burning, uh, they'll have no means to go in until another apparatus arrives. And so what we believe is with this legislation, we would be able to sit down with our employer and Again, not just the safety of the firefighters, because it does put firefighters at risk. We're talking about the safety of the citizens to talk about that safety for adequate staffing. Thank you. Um, Professor Slater, um, Mr. Messenger in his uh, remarks uh, described that uh, the, the, the legislation we're considering today runs afoul of the 10th Amendment. I'm sure this is something that you've thought about and possibly written about. I was wondering if you could comment on, on that constitutional issue. Well, there's two issues involved here. The first is the, the straight Tenth Amendment issue. When Congress extended employment laws such as the Fair Labor Standards Act and various anti-discrimination laws to public employees, there was a, a brief uh, dispute in the courts in the 70s and 80s about whether the Tenth Amendment barred that. But ever since um, I was in law school, which was a long time ago, uh, the, the courts have rejected Tenth Amendment claims. The Fair Labor Standards Act, any discrimination laws apply to public employees as well as private employees. There is a Eleventh Amendment issue coming from the case of Alden versus Maine that would only apply to state employees where states have limited immunity. Uh, for private suits for money damages, but that wouldn't be a problem under this law because it's enforced by a federal agency, the Federal Labor Relations Agency Authority. Great, thank you for um, uh, clarifying that point. And um, Mr. Patterson, um, again, we heard about Wisconsin's experience uh, after it changed its labor uh, laws. Uh, the fact of the matter is the Bureau of Labor Statistics in January reported that union membership among state and local government employees actually held steady in the wake of, of Janus. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on that and, um, you know, in terms of, obviously you're a, a union that's all across the country in terms of what you're seeing. Also in terms of what we're seeing in terms of efforts to, um, in, in the wake of Janus to, to, again, get folks to, to opt out, and yet nonetheless the, the statistics are showing that uh, it's, it's actually held quite steady. Um, yes, you're right, and I understood that to be sort of two questions, so let me, let me try to take them in, in reverse order. Um, there are currently dozens of corporate finance groups um, that have committed to spending 40 to $50 million in campaigns to try to dissuade uh, public, work worker, public sector workers to quit their union. 
Uh, these are glossy brochures that say things like, um, uh, uh, quit your union, lose nothing. The union still has to represent you. This is quite literally the message they're sending. And it hasn't worked. Why hasn't it worked? Because members know when they're being sold a bill of goods. They know what's at stake. Our members know that their union is just that. It's their union. And if they quit it, they know what they lose. And so these campaigns ha just, just haven't worked. They've fallen flat. And some are really gimmicky, like uh, this actually ha happened. Santa, one of these corporate-backed operatives were, was dressed like Santa Claus, handing out uh, union resignation letters uh, around Christmas saying, give yourself a pay raise. Um, those kinds of things don't work with our members because the most powerful thing is an educated, empowered worker, and that's what unions do. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Allen of Georgia. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. And um, again, this is a, a great debate and, uh, that we're having here today. Uh, uh, you know, after hearing, after hearing uh, in this Congress, uh, my friends on the other side of the aisle continue to promote this federal one-size-fits-all policy on states and localities, and, and this hearing today seems not to be an exception uh, to that. Of course, we talked about the Supreme Court decision last year, which righted the ship as far as a significant win for workers' rights in the First Amendment. Uh, based on what I have studied, the PRO Act would undermine the rights of workers and states in, uh, in, in uh, my state of Georgia. Uh, we have been named the best state to do business uh, for six years uh, running. Uh, we are a right-to-work state, uh, and of course the reason that, the, uh, that we're, uh, our business and our economy is growing is that the first priority of every business, public or private, is, uh, is a skilled workforce. Uh, yes, there are many unions working in the state of Georgia. Um, in fact, I at one time was a part of one of those. And, um, but however, uh, the people in Georgia want a choice. And that's the reason our laws are written the way they are. And, uh, Mr. Messenger, the Supreme Court held decades ago that workers cannot be required to pay a political portion of union dues. Um, as, as far as the, uh, the H.R. 2474 is concerned, it would ban state right-to-work laws, uh, forcing millions of private sector employees to pay union dues or lose their job. Uh, are private sector unions uh, dues uh, being used for political purposes and speech to accomplish just that very thing? Uh, yes, I believe that they are. A portion of union dues, even in the private sector, are used for uh, political expenses. Uh, employees do have some rights to object to paying for uh, that political portion. However, private sector employees absent a right to work law, can be forced to support other union speech and advocacy. For example, their speech vis-a-vis uh, -vis their employer. And as you mentioned, H.R. Uh, 2474 uh, would strip employees of their right to work protections, such as in Georgia, and allow unions to force them to pay uh, fees uh, as a condition of their employment. Uh, currently, we have, and you know, it's, I guess it could be debated, but. But obviously, the economy is doing well, and I think it's the best in the world. Uh, you know, we got more jobs, and we got job seekers, and uh, of course, that's, what, that's why we have teacher shortages. That's why we, you know, looking for people to work in public sector and private areas. And uh, uh, but the thing that one of the concerns that I have is that uh, union le leadership in the public and private sector alike. Uh, have a long history of com corruption, embezzlement, and other wrongdoings uh, when they uh, are left unaccountable to rank and file workers. And uh, in fact, I looked it up uh, the, uh, for the record, uh, as about $16 million went to members of Congress from public sector political contributions, public sector unions. 90% uh, went to one specific party. Um, and so, Mr. Messenger, uh, 
Do any public sector bills being discussed today help prevent instances of fraud and corruption that might go on that, uh, uh, you know, here we, we're talking about the taxpayers, okay? I represent the taxpayers. And uh, uh, what do you see out there as far as instances of government union corruption negatively impacting our taxpayers? Yes, I didn't see anything in H.R. 2474 that would prevent union corruption. In fact, by reinstituting forced fee requirements and overriding state right to work laws, H.R. 2474 would facilitate uh, that kind of corruption. Because when employees have the choice to decide whether or not to support a union, they can hold the union and its leadership accountable by withdrawing their financial support if the union is mismanaging the assets. However, if um, State Senator wanted to say something, and I got five seconds. Go ahead, sir. You have one. That's an excellent point. And when corruption is uncovered, it's because of federal LM reporting requirements in the, in, the, uh, in the private sector. Most states do not have the equivalent in the public sector. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Out of time, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fudge of Ohio with the red scarf. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I thought you were going to introduce me as distinguished, too. So let me see if I can distinguish myself today. Um, you know, it's just, it's just so pleasant to hear uh, my colleague, Mr. Allen, talk about supporting choice. I hope maybe one day you all will support a woman's right to choose what she wants to do with her own body. Um, Mr. Patterson, so happy to see you here. You know, my mother is a retiree of AFSCME. She's still very, very involved in her union. And uh, I grew up in a household that made me know early on what unions can do for people. So thank you for being here. Uh, Ms. Whitaker, it's a pleasure to meet you as well. I understand you are one of my sorority sisters, so welcome. I have a question for you, Ms. Whitaker. Um, we are in the midst of a national teacher shortage. We have lost more than 26,000 just African-American teachers over the last uh, eight to 10 years. Can you tell me why you think that is happening? I mean, I understand we've got some poor working conditions and low pay, but tell me why you think that's happening. We tend to lose African-American teachers yearly. The main reason African-American teachers are not staying, not just the pay, the working conditions. If you are not afforded the proper books, the materials that you would need to educate your children, and pay, it makes for a rough day. Our children need to see African Americans in the classroom. Also, we need male teachers, African American male teachers. Every male in here would like to be able to provide for his family. And males, they're not coming. If they come, they're only there for a short period of time. So in Miami, you can barely afford to live where you work. Well, it, it's, is it true that one in five teachers have a second job? Yes, ma'am, we do. So the economy is not as great as they say? No, it's um, not. Let me ask you a question, uh, Mr. Slater. Uh, last year's teacher strikes marked a four decade high in strikes in the United States. And most of them occurred in states uh, where collective bargaining rights we're not there to protect teachers. Can you tell me why this was inevitable where we find ourselves today? From the 1960s through the present, the one thing that we know from experience is that strikes in the public sector are most common where there are no collective bargaining rights for public workers. And as you say, that was true in almost all or essentially all of the states where there were teacher strikes last year. The reason is that workers feel, often justifiably, that they have no other options to get their employer to listen to their concerns, to really take them under consideration. Um, in contrast, in my state of Ohio, which not only grants, uh, on your state of Ohio, which not only Correct. grants uh, 
uh, collective bargaining rights to uh, teachers but permits them to strike in some circumstances, there are very few teacher strikes. There's an average, as I'm sure you know, of about one strike in all the public sector every year in Ohio because there are alternatives. There's fact-finding, there's mediation, there is what we call interest arbitration. There are realistic alternatives where workers can feel they can get their voices heard in these states, unlike states without collective bargaining rights, where strikes are unfortunately a, a frequent last resort. Thank you. Um, it seems to me, as I have listened to the testimony, that those who find themselves not able to be protected by uh, unions find their jobs much more difficult, and even some of them who are, that are in states that do not support and believe in the fundamental right to collectively bargain. They are being mistreated in ways that we have been looking at for many, many, many years. People know that it is labor unions who created the middle class in this country. That is why we have a five-day work week. That's why we have sick time, paid sick time, vacation time, because of labor. So what I'm hearing from my colleagues is that they don't want any of that. You know, they, they, they just want to save money instead of deal with people. So money is not everything, but clearly, if we can't pay our teachers who teach our children a decent wage, there is something wrong in this country. So that's just my point of view. I hope I've distinguished myself, Madam Chair. I yield back. <laughs> you did, with you putting on that red scarf. <laughs> Thank you. This is, this is, we wear red on Wednesdays for the Shebok girls, and uh, that's why you see red on, this, on the audience, and even Mr. Uh, Wahlberg wears red every Wednesday. You see him? The distinguished Mr. Wahlberg. <laughs> Thank you so much. And now Mr. Banks of Indiana. Thank you, Madam Chair. As one of the co-authors of the Indiana Right to Work Law, I've had some experience uh, with this particular topic. And I just want to note today how radical some of these proposals are that we're debating. Democrats are seeking to impose their will on the American people by subverting the collective bargaining laws passed by their own state governments. I want to make something very clear. Washington, D.C. has no business telling Hoosiers how to run their own state government. Indiana's collective bargaining rules have been in place since 2005. And we've been a right-to-work state since 2012. The choice of whether to change those laws rests with Hoosier voters, not the Democrats on this committee. Senator Onder, I want to I want to start with you, and I and I want to commend you for the work that you've done on this particular issue in Missouri. Could you talk for a minute about how the federal government takeover of collective bargaining rules would specifically hurt your state? And specifically, can you talk for a little bit about how it would undermine workers' rights regarding agency fees and transparency of union expenditures? Yes, I think that's a very good point. And what I would add is not only would these two bills undermine the principle of federalism, the right of states, Indiana, Missouri, to set their own public sector labor policy, but even undermine the ability of political subdivisions, school boards and fire boards in cities and counties to, to negotiate with their workers and set their labor policies. Um, but I think transparency is extraordinarily important. When we've uncovered in instances of, of union misuse of fees and corruption, it's almost always been in the private sector because of federal LM reporting that's been required since 1959 in the private sector union arena. So that's why uh, House Bill 1413 in Missouri um, required that similar uh, disclosure of the use of union dues. Um, we also, in 1413, extended to workers the right to vote, whether or not they uh, want to be part of a monopoly representation workforce controlled by unions. Not every worker wants that. Um, some of the testimony um, by um, some of the witnesses alluded to the political activity of, the, of their various unions. Not all workers want to be part of that political activity. So these bills are a massive federal overreach. They are a, 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 a huge violation of the principle of federalism. And um, I, you know, I commend your work um, in, in Indiana and on this committee uh, in fighting for the rights of states and of, of, the, of the people expressed through their elected officials. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Messenger, 
The recent Janus decision allowed government workers in non-right-to-work states to opt out of forced union dues. Is there any data on how many workers in those states have actually chosen to not pay those agency fees? Well, we know one thing is that all the forced fee payers, which were individuals who were not union members who were being forced to pay these compulsory fees against their will, were almost all entirely freed in the wake of Janus, because Janus was unequivocal that the government could not take these individuals' money for union fees without their affirmative consent. But the next question becomes, how many individuals who are union members, because they now have the right to choose whether to support a union, decided to drop out? And the numbers on that are still really undetermined. They're just rolling in. It's uh, tomorrow's the one-year anniversary of Janus, so there's really not uh, hard numbers yet on how many exercised that choice. Uh, but I want to emphasize the most important thing isn't how many exercise that choice to be union members or non-members, but the fact they have that choice. You know, prior to Janus, they didn't have the right to choose whether to support a union. The government and union officials forced them whether they wanted to or not. And now they have that choice. And even if few exercise it, uh, it's still a very important principle. Okay. Thank you for that. With that, I'll yield back. Thank you. And now, Dr. Shalala of Florida, former secretary of HHS. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Madam Chair. I did wear red today, I want to point out. Um, uh, Mr. Patterson, uh, we are having a debate about federalism. This is, in fact, um, is um, a debate about federalism. I agree with my colleagues. But federalism also allows us, as members of Congress, to identify when there is a national interest. Um, in minimum standards, um, in, in human rights, for example, in civil rights. Um, and it is a debate about how workers ought to be treated and what are the mechanism by which they'll get fair treatment. So um, could you talk a little about what is the national interest that justifies the kind of legislation uh, that we're talking about? Uh, yes, I'd be happy to, and I, I think it touches on the, uh, what I was saying before about how it's the same interest that, um, uh, for which Congress passed the National Labor Relations Act. And it's, it's, this bill um, is not unique in the sense that Congress would be um, enacting provisions governing employer and employee relations and terms in public employment. There's a, a litany of examples where Congress has, has done that, and it's worked well, uh, and it also in conformity with principles of federalism. So, I mean, I could rattle off a, a number of acts like the, the Fair Labor Standards Act or the ADA. The ADA, Act, ADA actually requires public employers to sit down and, and engage in a collaborative process with employees to reach accommodations when, when, they, when they have disabilities. So that's one example where Congress have found that, that the Commerce Clause Authority um, is, is, is significant and the effects on commerce are significant enough to establish a minimum standard. Uh, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, the P Equal Pay Act. Uh, recently in 2008, the uh, GINA, the Gen Genetic uh, Information uh, Non-Disclosure Act, USERA, which governs um, our inveterates, so important to preserve their rights in terms of their employment relations in state and local employment. This is just, this act that's before you today is just one example of the many ways in which the recognition of this important sector of the economy sh should be leveled and should have a level uh, standard that applies to all public servants, whether they're a nurse in a hospital, or a, uh, working in a, cor a correctional facility, or any number of, of, of um, occupations and industries that have a very important effect on commerce and are actually integral to the fabric of our economy. Thank you. Um, I want to welcome uh, Tina Whitaker from uh, Miami, Florida. We're happy to have you here. Um, collective bargaining helps not just the teachers and students, but also the whole community. Could you talk a little about your experience with UTD, how having a union supported your school, school's broader Miami-Dade community? As a union, we're all over Miami-Dade County. We are in our communities. We're not just a union within our school building or at our headquarters at United Teachers of Dade. Our communities see us there. 
they call and we're there. We're at book fairs, parades. We're at community events where our children are. We're at churches. A lot of us do attend our churches and synagogues, so they see us often. Even when there was a government shutdown, United Teachers of Date was there for the community. We're not a selfish union. We provide school supplies for those students that cannot afford them. Even the pre-K teachers, we provide school supplies for them because unfortunately, the funding that the teachers are given for supplies, the pre-K teachers are not included. United Teachers of Dade, we are a family and we look out for our community. We're out there. Yes, we do advocacy and activism, but that is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to look out for those that are next door to you, regardless of whether you're a teacher, a firefighter, a professor, a senator, a congressperson. You're supposed to look out for the people that are in your community. I always tell my students, learn to lobby for yourselves. That learn to advocate for you. And I always tell them, I said, listen, I start my year out and I want you to be able to understand. I go back to when I have to teach the Holocaust, but I'd start early. When they came for the socialists, I said nothing. When they came for the trade unionists, I said nothing. When they came for me, no one was there to speak for me. United Teachers of Day, we speak for our community, not just the teachers, but we're there for everyone in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you. I yield. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And now, Mr. Uh, Dr. Fox, our ranking member of the entire committee. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses all for being here today. Um, Mr. Messenger, Democrats' labor agenda this Congress has been about imposing the will of union bosses on unwitting states, employers, employees, and others in order to reverse the decades-long decline in union membership. Why might it be in the interest of union bosses to undermine right to work, secret ballots, and employee privacy? How do these proposals relate to the original intent of the National Labor Relations Act? Well, all three of those uh, issues, the compulsory unionism with the compulsory fees, the taking away of the secret ballot election, and the disclosure of private information, are all intended to facilitate allowing union officials to exert their power over individuals who may not want to associate uh, with that union. And it perverts the original uh, intent of the National Labor Relations Act, well, or of the ta as amended by the Taft-Hartley Act, I should say, which was to facilitate employee free choice, not to have a one-sided uh, pro-union type agenda. And in fact, you can see that through the legislative history. <coughs> it originally enacted the National Labor Relations Act was rather one-sided, but Congress corrected that in 1947 with the Taft-Hartley Act to provide that employees have the right to refrain from supporting a union and to protect them from unfair labor practices caused uh, by union and union officials. And so there is some balance uh, at present within the structure of the National Labor Relations Act. But bills you know, like the PRO Act are meant to upset that balance and very much skew things back uh, against individual uh, employees. Thank you. That's the way it seems to us, and we appreciate um, your point of view. Dr. Senator Onder, <laughs> thank you for being here. I would say you're a good example of what Ms. Whitaker says about giving back to the community. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. My home state of North Carolina is one of just three states that has no government union collective bargaining. It's also one of the fiscally healthiest states in the country, as evidenced by several massive revenue surpluses in recent years. Based on your experience as a state lawmaker, do you believe North Carolina's fiscal strength can be tied to the absence of collective bargaining in government? How might imposing government union collective bargaining in North Carolina risk the state's fiscal condition? Well, very good question. Um, I think it very well may. Um, and conversely, I think the poor fiscal health of some other states, Connecticut, Illinois, New Jersey, California, can be traced to 
uh, to, to the collective bargaining um, agreements that have been reached over the years between government and unions. Um, if, we look at, if we look at pension liabilities, in New Jersey, every man, woman, and child in the state of New Jersey owes $26,000. If we look at Connecticut, $33,000. And those pension liabilities are the product of decades of negotiations between public sector collective bargaining uh, representatives and politicians. Now, I'm not here today to say that the federal government should preempt all that. I believe New Jersey and Connecticut and California and Illinois have to get their own house in order. But I am saying quite the opposite, that it is up to North Carolina, to Missouri, to Georgia, to decide what we want our public sector policy to be that is important to the principle of federalism and even to the sovereignty of the voters who elect us. Thank you. Mr. Messenger, Democrats seek to impose binding arbitration on both public and private sector collective bargaining negotiations, essentially empowering unaccountable bureaucrats to determine workers' contracts and employers' costs. What problems might this create for employers' financial stability as well as the unique needs of employees? Well, there's two issues, the first of which is that, you know, going through the binding interest arbitration process could result in terms uh, that are disastrous for the employer. Uh, at the end, at, under current collective bargaining law, an employer does not have to agree to any particular terms. It has to bargain to impasse, but doesn't have to agree to them. If you go to binding arbitration, suddenly the arbitrator is in control of important company policies that may control the fate of that company. And also, binding arbitration may upset the constitutional basis on which the National Labor Relations Act was upheld. Uh, when it was originally passed, one of the reasons it survived constitutional challenge is because it didn't enforce employers to enter into agreements with unions that bind their employees. If the arbitration would, of course, change that and potentially open the act up to legal challenge. Thank you very much, and thank you, Madam Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Levin from Michigan. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman. Thanks for having this important, important hearing. I want to start by just going to much more fundamentals than we've talked about. Uh, all this talk about compulsory, mandatory unionism, which simply means when workers as a group choose to form a union, it binds the group, like many other democratic decisions. This horrifies Mr. Messenger, who's part of an industry that is, seeks to do nothing other than destroy collective bargaining in the United States. Uh, the United States is not in compliance with fundamental international human rights norms when workers like Ms. Whitaker and Mr. Brewer do not have the freedom of association at work. ILO conventions 87 and 98, which to our shame the United States has not ratified, require all workers in society, including public sector workers, to have the freedom of association. It is a fundamental human right, which is denied. The idea that we're having this hearing and having people and the minority talk about how great it is that we're denying a fundamental human right to millions of American workers is not something that would happen in virtually any other country in the world, in the world. And it's a shame on our country that we're even having this discussion. And I'm here to get us there somehow to get this country to the point where we recognize workers' rights to have freedom of association at work to get the kind of basic things that Mr. Brewer's talked about, safety for firefighters, effectiveness for firefighters, basic rights for teachers in Florida and other states. I want to ask you a couple questions, Dr. Slater, um, about the laws that states have been passing to make it harder and harder for workers to organize at the state and local level. Uh, some states have required, for example, periodic decertification elections. I, I don't see them requiring election, you know, procedures for businesses to be able to, you know, destroy their local chamber of commerce or something. It's just a unique anti-unionism in this country in the public sector. Um, but I want to 
have you explain how these laws are designed to undermine unions and uh, whether they also have the effect of undermining or uh, hurting government operations? Yeah, well, well, two things in response. First, you're absolutely right that the United States is in violation of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights and International Labor Organization Declaration of Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work um, in terms of collective bargaining for all employees, including public employees, being a fundamental human right. And in fact, both Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have stated that U.S. laws in this area and some states violate um, international law. Um, as to the decertification laws, a, a few states, Wisconsin and Iowa, that I can think of off the top of my head, you talked earlier about Florida, mandatory re recertification elections every year, whether anybody wants it or not. The way labor law has traditionally worked, both in the public and private sectors in this country, is you have, you can have re recertification elections maybe every three, or at minimum every three years, if 30% of the workers want it. And that's still true in all the states that provide collective bargaining laws. These states that require mandatory recertification laws, whether no one wants it or not, it's clearly an attempt to destabilize um, labor relations. Unions have to constantly be in a re-election mode, whether anybody wants them to be or not. Employers don't know how long they have to sign a contract for. Employees don't know what their rights and wages and obligations will be at work. The average union contract lasts about three years. That provides for stability and predictability for both parties. Um, I don't think any of the governors who signed their, these laws into effect would want themselves to be up for re-election every single year because that would create political instability. Same thing for unions. Thank you. And how have the, has the broader um, attack on basic uh, the rights of, 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 of public sector workers to have collective bargaining affected the operations of, of local or state governments? It's destabilized them. It's created a lot of people who have left public employment. Um, in Wisconsin, for example, there's a lot of people who fled public employment. And more generally, um, weakening unions increases wage inequality. Thank you, and my time's expired, Madam Chairman. I just want to thank you again for your tremendous leadership in this effort and emphasize uh, the need for us to pass these bills. Thanks, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Wright from Texas. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Messenger, are you horrified? Because you don't look horrified to me. <laughs> I'm not, sir. I didn't think so. Um, I am glad that we're discussing fundamental rights because to me, the right to work is rather fundamental. And other fundamental rights are enshrined in the Bill of Rights, one of which includes the Tenth Amendment. And um, that's a very important amendment. A lot of people want to ignore it, but it's there for a very important reason. And when the Constitution was, was written, Mr. Messenger, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't it the states that created the federal government or was it the other way around? The states created, created the federal government. And that's why we have the Tenth Amendment, isn't it? Yes. Um, I'm from Arlington, Texas, and I used to serve on the, on the city council there for eight years, and Texas, of course, is a right to work state. Uh, it's one of the fastest growing states, and people, workers, and companies are literally flocking to Texas and have been for 20 years from overregulated states and they're doing that for a reason. That's because we still have freedom and opportunity in Texas, partly because we're a right to work state. Now when I was on the city council, we had very robust police association, firefighter association, um, and we, uh, the city council worked with them routinely um, and if they wanted something and the council didn't give it to them, they could go to the people. They could go to the people. And if they could get uh, a petition to put something on the ballot, they could, and they did, and succeeded. Um, I also, after I was on city council, I was a county official, Tarrant County, which is 15th largest county in America. It's large, a lot of employees. It's also one of the highest paid of any county uh, in Texas. Uh, Tarrant County pays its workers higher than uh, other urban counties in Texas that are larger. Now, Tarrant County, 
by the way, is uh, majority Republican on commissioner's court. Uh, they're the ones that decide what the budget is and how much people are going to be paid. Uh, and our workers get paid more than like Dallas County, which is controlled by Democrats, Bayer County, which is controlled by Democrats, and I can go on and on. My point is this, this notion that there has to be collective bargaining or workers aren't going to be paid enough or workers are going to be underpaid compared to everybody else is absolute nonsense, at least in Texas. That's not true at all. And we're a right to work state and it works. I wanted to ask you, Senator, do you see the same kind of result in Missouri? Yes, we do. And in fact, um, in Missouri, we've had public sector collective bargaining since 1965. But for police and teachers, we've only had it since 2007. And in between police and teachers, Fraternal Order of Police, the Missouri State Teachers Association, would get together in meet and confer uh, sessions with management, with the local um, political subdivision leaders. And the system worked well. We didn't have this one-size-fit-all federally mandated regime that these two bills advocate. So yes, I agree with you that, that labor and management can work together without imposing a federal structure on our cities and our counties and our school boards. Right, thank you. I, I think uh, what's before us today do, does not expand freedom or opportunity. In fact, I think it's horribly oppressive on the states. And I'm going to yield the remainder of my time to the ranking member. Thanks. I thank the gentleman. And I thank, uh, thank you for your history lesson there of, of Texas. Um, uh, Mr. Messenger, one of the reforms included in Missouri's collective bargaining reform is a requirement that unions stand for periodic recertification elections, as we've talked about. Uh, to your knowledge, does any such requirement currently exist for private sector workers under NLRA? It does not exist. Uh, in fact, most private sector workers have never had the opportunity to vote on union representation. I believe a recent study showed that over 90 percent have actually never voted for the union that currently represented them because the union was voted in or car checked in many, many years ago, sometimes even decades ago. And there's never been an election because under the National Labor Relations Act, unless employees can affirmatively put together a 30 percent petition within a very narrow period of time, they're precluded uh, from demanding an election. And there's a variety of tactics that are used, such as merging bargaining units and such, uh, that make it extremely difficult for employees to decertify, making the need for recertification elections that much more apparent. I thank you and yield back to uh, Mr. Wright. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Norcross from New Jersey. Thank you. I heard when I was out of room that uh, my state was garnering some attention. Um, we're rather unique. We have something called public officials with a union label. We have members, rank and file members from different parts of the state who've run for public office. See, we think it's a good idea to have somebody who understands day in and day out what the average worker goes through. Because one thing we understand, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And the suggestions that I've heard today certainly make that uh, absolutely clear. Uh, I hear about strikes and shutdowns that if public employees uh, had more power would happen. If I recall correctly, didn't we sort of have a strike here when we shut down government? That's a different story. We'll leave that for another day. Uh, certainly. Uh, the recertification, let's be clear here. You can decertify a union. That's available to any member at any day by putting that together. So don't confuse the issues here by talking about that. It's about balance, it's about fairness. You don't want it one side or the other. You want a cooperative working relationship, something we certainly could use here in Congress that at the end of the day, when you have this discussion, it becomes a better workplace. In my career, prior to coming here to Washington, I was a, an electrician, construction electrician, and one of the most important things in collective bargaining is safety, safety on the job. During my period of working out in the field, 
I experienced three horrible days when somebody on my job was killed. Something you will never forget. So when they talk about overreach of government, OSHA has saved thousands of lives, or in state, they call it P-OSHA. That's the sort of regulation that you want, that you work together. And quite often, as part of the collective bargaining agreement, are those safety committees that are put together. But it's the bargaining table where this should take place. Um, the idea of allowing the states to have the same set of basic foundation for those employees who want, it's their choice if they want to join a union. But when they don't have the fundamental right to do it, that's where we're having a problem. So, um, Mr. Patterson, I've seen, I've talked about the failure to protect workers. Um, talk to me about those safety conditions that might be talked about or written into a collective bargaining agreement and how there is either an advantage or disadvantage of doing that. Health and safety, when you talk to workers about one of their most uh, pressing concerns, um, the answer is uh, often health and safety is at the top of the list. And frankly, workers are the people who know what the risks are and they know what can be done to uh, mitigate or eliminate those risks. And frankly, they're the, they're the ones that suffer if that's, if that's not done. The process of collective bargaining has and does and has always included uh, bargaining over uh, safety standards and protocols and the give and take of ensuring the employer commits adequate resources to ensuring worker safety. And, and not just worker safety, but the safety of customers and other people who might be on the job site. When collective bargaining laws are eliminated or at least uh, dramatically curtailed, like for instance uh, in Iowa uh, recently, then um, workers and their unions do not have that ability and things can quickly go by the wayside. Um, after the Iowa law, HF 291, was passed, sometime after that, we had a member who was actually, uh, Tina Suka, who was actually uh, a mental health hospital worker in Independence, Iowa, uh, was, was um, injured severely on the job by one of the uh, patients in that facility who was having an episode. Uh, and the reason is because the um, safety harness was new and, and, and was not one that the workers had uh, had sufficient training in and uh, she was hospitalized. But what's worse than that is that not only was she hospitalized as a result of this extremely dire um, physical attack, was that w while in the hospital, she um, used all her leave and the employer fired her. Now, if we had still had uh, robust collective bargaining rights in Iowa, then, those, uh, then the union could have negotiated over the leave the employees could have gotten together and pulled their leave uh, so that she would have the leave to get well, um, and they could have grieved her discipline, but all of these basic fundamental collective bargaining rights were eliminated. Thank you. We're running out of time again. I wanna thank the committee for putting this hearing together. Together, working together in a cooperative relationship, we really can get this done. Thank you, Mr. Norcross. And now, um, Ms. Underwood, Illinois. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm so pleased that we're having this hearing today. You know, Janice was an Illinois case, and so this is particularly important to many of my constituents. Um, I'm also pleased that uh, Ms. Whitaker is here. Uh, I, I thank you for your many years of service to the children uh, in your community. And we talked with the Illinois Federation of Teachers and our friends at ASME Council 31 to prepare for the hearing today. And so um, I'm, just, I'm just really delighted. Um, you know, part of the benefits of union membership are ensuring that we have equal pay. And one of the, one of the things that we did at the beginning of this Congress was, uh, on this committee, was we passed the Fit Paycheck Fairness Act. And when we think about equal pay for all workers, workers of color, for women, uh, unions have led the way, and particularly in the public sector. And so I think it's critically important to reference um, that leadership, the historic leadership role that public sector unions have played uh, with respect to paycheck fairness and equal pay. 
My question is for Mr. Buer and Mr. Patterson. Um, it's related to public health. Um, I'm a nurse, and I've spent my career as a public health nurse working to expand coverage around the country. And so what would you say to those who argue that unionization of public safety officials and firefighters would have an adverse impact on public health? Well, I'll, I'll address the nurses. You can address the firefighters. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, look, the, the, there's a, a tremendous amount of, of, of research uh, done by um, uh, higher education institutions in the nursing field by epidemiologists, by sociologists, by public health experts that shows where nurses have a voice on the job and have a representative who can um, uh, amplify that voice and bring that voice to the bargaining table that patient outcomes improve. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I could go on, but the, the evidence is out there and, and it is a, a clear uh, dynamic and so collective bargaining uh, it improves not only working conditions but patient outcomes in that field. Thank you. Mr. Brewer. Uh, yeah, and I would add to that as, as our jobs as uh, firefighters have evolved over the years, you know, we're at the point now where not only are we, you know, fighting fires, responding to natural, natural, you know, natural disasters, we're also medics uh, and we're EMTs. So uh, anytime there's a car accident, anytime an ambulance is dispatched somewhere, firefighters are responding. Uh, you know, we work with different agencies to show the effectiveness of four-person CPR. You know, so when you look at the save rates um, at places like Charlotte, and it was even brought up here today, you know, those studies show that where the union's involved and where we can advocate for these things, where we can advocate for uh, you know, four on a truck for four, you know, for four person CPR for car accidents where we're going to have to do patient care and extrication at the same time. All of this has a major impact on, on the public and the public health. And when we think about uh, current priorities and challenges that we struggle with as a nation, like the opioid epidemic, right? We know that many of our firefighters are on the front line in every community in this country combating. And I know that your union has been active in preparing your members uh, for responding to that public, uh, that public health emergency. Would you like to speak on that? Absolutely. Uh, you know, and a lot of times, a lot of these conversations today, we've centered around pay and that we're going to bargain for pay. But we bargain for a lot more than pay. Mm -hmm. It is about health and safety. It is about how can we provide better care for the public? How can we provide better care for our members? So, and, and you know, the, the opioid epidemic, uh, we've done numerous public announcements, training um, at a lot of our conferences and stuff, and then we take that back from the international and, you know, disperse it at a state level and on a local level. So, uh, yeah, we are, we always say that we're on the front lines for everything, and, uh, and firefighters are throughout this country, no matter what the situation, we're called a lot of times, and we're glad to serve, but it would make it a lot easier if we could sit down with our employer and talk about what we need and how we can make it even better. Well, I thank you so much for the work that you do in your communities, and thank you for being here to share your stories with the committee today. I yield back my time, Madam Chairman. I yield my time to uh, Mr. Scott. You want to? You yield your time to Mr. Scott? Okay. Yes. You don't have? You bet. I yield back. I yield it back. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Scott has his own time. <laughs> Thank you so much. We appreciate that. This is our distinguished chairperson of the Education and Labor Committee, Dr. Scott. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Patterson, uh, could you tell us what, rep what uh, obligation you have to represent non-members of the union when there is a union? Yes, I can. Um, I think what you're referring to is, is the, what's, what's known under the law as the duty of, of fair representation, which is that when a union uh, represents um, workers, it's not just representing its members or its dues-paying members, it's representing the entire collective bargaining uh, uh, unit um, that elected it to represent them. 
Um, and so the duty of fair representation requires that the union fairly represent, as it indicates, everyone, not just the members, but also non-members. And if uh, an individual non-dues non paying member has an individualized case and you represent others in individualized cases, would you have an obligation to represent that person notwithstanding the fact that they're not paying dues? That's correct. We absolutely do have that obligation, yes. And in a fair share situation where non-members have to pay a fair share, what are they paying for? Well, in, in the private sector, uh, which it currently does uh, permit the employer and the union to negotiate a fair share system, it doesn't actually impose it as a matter of law, but they can negotiate in the contract, and most unions do, precisely because the union is obligated uh, to represent the entire bargaining unit, and, um, and it does so, but that comes at a financial cost. It, it's, now, now, the fair share that, that's imposed, is that the full union dues or just a portion of it? No, the, the non-member's fair share fee is, the, is limited to the cost of representation. It does not include political or ideological expenditures or other things like, you know, members, parties, and things like that. It's purely the cost of representation. That you're obligated to perform. That's correct, under the law. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Slater, uh, you'd mentioned um, international standards. Where would we see these inter international standards uh, realize? Would it be in treaties and trade uh, agreements and things like that? Where would we see the international standards for labor, labor rights? The international standards I referenced earlier would be in um, trade agreements and treaties, as you say, but also in the laws of the member countries, so in the laws of France, the laws of Germany, the laws of other Western European countries, you would see guarantees for rights of all employees, including public sector workers, to bargain collectively. And based on those international standards, did I understand you to say that many states don't come up to those minimum standards? Well, it depends how you mean many. I mean, one thing that should be clear is this bill would not affect the majority of states. The bill provides that we would, the FLRA, the Federal Labor Relations Authority, would review state laws to see if they met certain minimums. And I can say confidently that a clear majority of states do meet those minimums. But in, there's about eight states that don't provide any public employees the right to collectively bargain, about a dozen more that uh, provide collective bargaining rights only to one or two types of employees. And in those states, uh, yes, we are not in compliance with international law. And if, um, if a country had those provisions, is it likely that we wouldn't do a trade agreement with them? If, if a country had provisions? If a country didn't have uh, those minimum labor rights, is it likely that we wouldn't do a trade agreement with them? Don't we usually have in oh, yeah, yes, we, we, we do look, um, I, I think our, our, the better policy is to look at whether other countries have certain minimal labels, labor standards before we do treaties with them, yes. Thank you. Uh, Senator Onder, uh, in, in Senate Bill 1413, uh, can you, um, you have a provision in there that requires a union recertification, that requires an absolute majority vote, whether voting or not, which essentially means that a no vote, a non-vote is counted as a no vote. Is that part of the, that bill? So under 1413, every three years, there would be a recertification election, and recertification would require a majority of all those members of the bargaining unit to vote yes. And, um, th you know, because these voters are all found within the workplace, within the bargaining unit, uh, this has not proved to be a uh, overly burdensome uh, 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 procedure uh, in Iowa. Well over 95 percent, I believe, of the bargaining units did recertify under Iowa's law. You and I would be in trouble if we had to run an election so like that. What is what's the status of the uh, bill at this point? So at the, in um, in March, as was mentioned earlier, a judge in St. Louis County enjoined the entire bill, and uh, which is, uh, I, I believe, a, 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 an act of judicial overreach of the highest order. They, uh, the judge did not even consider provision by provision, but uh, 
enjoined the entire um, bill. It's awaiting trial in January. Thank you. Mr. Taylor from Texas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate uh, this hearing, appreciate the witnesses. And uh, in, I served in the state legislature in Texas for eight years, and uh, I happen to represent, uh, I live in the highest per capita income city in North America with over a quarter million people. Uh, and as businesses come, and they primarily come from union states, uh, and when they cite reasons they come, they talk about how Plano has great schools, uh, how we're investing in roads, uh, how we have a low tax burden. Uh, but another thing that is very consistently mentioned is we're a right-to-work state. Uh, and I think the success of my community, certainly the high per capita income is great, uh, but also just looking at the employment numbers, uh, since January 2017, we've created 620,000 jobs in Texas, and we have a 3.5% unemployment rate, which is the lowest it's ever been. So clearly what has worked for Texas, uh, what's worked for my community, I hope that Congress can leave well enough alone and say, hey, they're they've got it right and they're doing a good job. But, uh, and, and Senator, thank you for being here. I appreciate your service, and uh, I, I know what it means to be a senator. It's great that you're, you're being here. I never had to do that extra duty, so thank you for taking the time to be thank here you. from the Show Me State. Um, but, uh, and, and Mr. Messenger, I'm just gonna ask you a very, very technical question about uh, H.R. 1154, and it imposes, uh, without imposing a penalty that strikes uh, for or illegal for public safety officers only when they quote will meet or measurably disrupt the delivery mercies of close quote and and are quote designed to compel an employer to agree to terms of the contract close quote based on your reading uh, does anything in HR 1154 prevent a government union from striking over a political or legislative issue I mean do, is there anything to stop them from not striking nothing to do with work but they can strike over some kind of political issue or legislative issue I've noticed no such restriction in the law uh, requiring uh, or you know, limiting what strikes can be over and preventing them you know, with respect to political type issues. Right, so like, I mean, an example would be, uh, I'm sure there are myriad examples, but obviously that creates a whole nother level which has nothing to do with work, right? I mean, I think we generally think of unions as being about work environment, pay, uh, conditions, uh, hours, uh, things like that, and a lot of the benefits that we've discussed today have been about those things precisely, but this allows, uh, you know, quote, unquote, politics to be involved and, to, and, and strikes to go based on politics. Yes, and as the Supreme Court recognized in Janus, you know, all collective bargaining in the public sector is political. I mean, ultimately, the union is trying to influence governmental policies, and even things like wages and such ultimately affect the public fisc and public services that can be provided. So in the public sector, all collective bargaining is political, which is one of the reasons the Supreme Court and Janus held that employees couldn't be forced to subsidize uh, that advocacy. So I guess what you're saying is you could see a strike that was purely political in nature and has nothing to do with actual work. I mean, the, the, or the work conditions or the employer or hour or pay or anything like that. I mean, it could just be a purely political, and then the employee, the, the union member, is then kind of forced to go on a strike that, 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 that in a political cause that they wouldn't even want to be part of. Yes, and some of the testimony today, I believe, supports that. You know, there's been the argument that collective bargaining, you know, affects public safety. I think that's one of the uh, justifications, you know, for uh, the bill that, which we're talking about. So we are talking about something that's political, ultimately, something that affects public safety, even uh, in the opinion of those who advocate, you know, for this bill. And so, yes, it's all political. Well, and so I think when we think about our constitutional rights and something that the Bill of Rights is something very important, I think, to every American. You know, in the First Amendment, we have the right to freedom of speech, right to freedom of association, three other rights. Uh, but, but compelling people to be part of an organization they don't want to be part of, and worse, compelling them to participate in political speech with something that may be an anathema to them, I think is, I think is a disturbing strike at the core of our democracy, at the core of this idea of, of fundamental of free speech, that we can say what we think and we don't have to worry about someone telling us what we're going to say and forcing us to go on a strike about a political cause that we don't support. I agree, I mean, monopoly bargaining in the public sector involves the government mandating that a particular organization, a union, speaks for a group of workers whether they approve or not. And in my opinion, that infringes you know, on their freedom of association, including even if there is a secret ballot election. You know, the Supreme Court said in West Virginia versus Barnett, the First Amendment exists to protect certain liberties from majority rule, and those liberties cannot be subjected to a majority vote. And so if each individual has 
the right to decide who represents them, who speaks for them in the relations with government, which they certainly do under the First Amendment, it's unconstitutional, in my opinion, to force individuals uh, to accept a representative, even pursuant to a majority vote. All right, thank you. And uh, Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Mr. Watkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Kansas. Thank you. In 2018, my home state of Kansas marked its 60th anniversary of becoming a right to work state. Kansas felt so strongly about this that in 1958, they voted in favor of adding right to work, a right to work amendment to our state's constitution. 27 states, including Kansas, have now passed laws that prohibit a worker from being forced to join a union and a Bureau of Labor Statistics shows the union membership rate was only 10.5% in 2018. This is down 0.2% from 2017. Uh, Senator Onder, uh, you are a neighbor in Missouri and in your state, your state went to the polls to vote on a proposition to enact a right to work, but the measure was defeated. We've heard a considerable amount today extolling the virtues of government union bargaining privileges. You yourself are from a state in which government employees have such privileges. They do. In your opinion, as a state lawmaker, do any of the benefits of government union bargaining justify Congress imposing it onto state and local governments? Or would it make more sense to advocate to advocates to have this debate in state capitals? I believe that it does make sense to have this debate in state capitals. I think there's no question that states have very different labor policies regarding public sector unionization, Wisconsin versus New Jersey, Kansas versus California. And I think our principles of federalism, our principles of democratic self-governance dictate that that remain the case. Um, I, one of the members emphasized the freedom of association at work being a fundamental human right. I would agree with that. Doesn't that include the right of that worker to, to decide whether he or she wants to join or support a union? Doesn't it include the right of that worker to periodically vote whether or not he wants to continue monopoly representation by a union? So I believe that our current system of federalism serves us well. The needs of New Jersey might be different than the needs of Kansas, uh, but to impose a one-size-fits-all tyrannical regime from Washington, I think is the wrong approach. Great, uh, thank you, Senator. And I yield the remainder of my time, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you so much. And now um, we, we want to welcome Ms. Finkenauer, who does not serve on our committee, but is a sponsor of the bill. Uh, Ms. Finkenauer of Iowa. Thank you, Chairwoman Wilson. And also thank you, Chairman Scott, for uh, allowing me to be here today and be part of this discussion, which is very personal to me. Um, I have to tell you, um, it, it has been an interesting uh, um, you know, a few moments here on this committee listening to some of the testimony today and uh, frustrated and disappointed by some of the rhetoric that I've heard spewed that's anti-union and anti-worker. Um, you know, State Senator Under, you are a neighbor to my home state of Iowa. I was a former state legislator myself for four years in Iowa. And I have to tell you, I, I've done some research while I've been up here and again, your rhetoric that you've been spewing against unions and also your record against working families is disappointing and quite frankly, offensive. You see, this is personal to me. And I grew up a daughter of a union pipe fitter welder in Iowa. My mom was a public school secretary. Heck, my grandfather was lieutenant firefighter who helped advocate for Iowa's bipartisan collective bargaining law back in the 70s. It's a law that had worked well in my state, and it is a law that sadly I saw destroyed during my time in the state house. You see, um, I will never forget February of 2017 standing on that state house floor after days of hearing testimony from my friends, my family, and my neighbors in my home state who are just working their tails off to provide for their families, folks like our teachers, 
our corrections officers, our bus drivers, who aren't asking for a whole heck of a lot, but we're asking to be treated with dignity and with respect. And there we were, standing on that state house floor, and I looked up into that gallery as my Republican colleagues in the state of Iowa were about to vote yes to gut their rights. And I looked up and I saw tears in many of their eyes, and I had tears of my own, thinking to myself in that moment that that is not how we treat people in my state or in my country, and I was going to do whatever I could to get it back. So here I am in Congress right now, working with my colleagues, trying to fight like heck for my friends, my family, and my neighbors, who I saw the state of Iowa let down. You see, uh, we've got a lot of issues since that gutting of collective bargaining happened in the state of Iowa. And heck, since 2011, actually, we've lost 1,000 public employees in the state. Um, these staffing shortages now that we have seen since the gutting of collective bargaining has resulted in a failure to train employees on vital safety measures, which have literally put their lives on the line. And in one state mental health facility in my own district, four employees have been attacked in the last 10 months. It's unconscionable. And again, this is not how you treat people in my state or in my country. Uh, the law also quite literally created a system that was rigged against working people, forcing unions to go through a costly and burdensome recertification process that was des designed to make them fail. But they didn't. As you said, 95% of them were recertified because they work their tails off and they appreciate their unions who step up for them, who have their backs every single day. And I'll have to tell you, I am proud to represent my friends, my family, and my neighbors. I was proud to represent them in the State House, and I am proud every day to represent them in Congress. And I'm also proud to now be a sponsor of the Public Service Freedom to Negotiate Act, again, with my colleagues here today. It prevents states from attacking public employees' collective bargaining rights like they did in Iowa, ensuring that they can negotiate for fair pay and safer workplaces. Um, I am grateful for all of you being here today, um, but I would really like to focus on these last few minutes of this committee if uh, Mr. Patterson and Dr. Slater can walk us through how this legislation that I mentioned, that Public Service Freedom to Negotiate Act, will help workers in states like Iowa, like mine, and like those across the country who have seen their rights already undermined. Uh, well, in the short time, thank you, and thank you for, su for supporting this bill and sponsoring it. We um, are very grateful. The, um, and I see I only have a few seconds, so let me just say that the um, bill essentially does three things. Uh, it ensures that a uh, major sector of the workforce can actually um, exercise the constitutional right to form and join a union. Um, it ensures that, that employers have to sit down and talk to the union and negotiate with the union that the workers have elected. And then, if they can't reach an agreement, it applies objective processes to make sure that those disputes don't boil over, that the parties don't resort to brinkmanship or other existential type of um, um, tactics, um, and instead work productively to reach a solution, uh, and for the better of everyone in the economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Thank you so much. You can uh, put that in to the record for us in writing, the answer. If that's, that would be for Ms. Um, Finkenauer and other members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. I remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practice, materials for submission for the hearing record must be submitted to the committee clerk within 14 days following the last day of the hearing, preferably in Microsoft Word format. The material submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing. Only a member of the committee or an invited witness may submit materials for inclusion in the hearing record. Documents are limited to 50 pages each. Documents longer than 50 pages will be incorporated into the record via an internet link that you must provide to the committee clerk within the required time frame but please recognize that years from now, that link may no longer work. 
Again, I want to thank the witnesses for their participation today. What we have heard is very, very valuable. Members of the committee may have some additional questions for you, and we ask the witnesses to please respond to those questions in writing. The hearing record will be open for 14 days in order to receive those responses. I remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practices, witness questions for the hearing record must be submitted to the majority committee staff or committee clerk within seven days. The questions submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing. Before recognizing the ranking member for his closing statement, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the following materials. Letters from the service employees in the National Union, the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, and the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers in support of the Public Service Freedom to Negotiate Act of 2019, H.R. 3463, and a letter from the National Association of, Association of Police Organizations Incorporated in support of the Public Safety Employer, Employee Cooperation Act, H.R. 1154. I also ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a statement from Senator Maisie Hirono, who has championed the Public Service Freedom to Negotiate Act in the Senate. Without objection, so ordered. I now recognize the distinguished ranking member for his closing statement. I thank the gentlelady and our chairman, and thank you for um, um, running the committee the way you have. I appreciate that. And I thank, uh, I thank all of the uh, the witnesses who have been here today. The panel has been uh, valuable to us. I especially want to thank uh, Ms. Whitaker and Captain Brewer for being here as evidences of the um, public sector employees that this legislation would definitely deal with. Being a son of a school teacher, a nephew of three school teachers, a father-in-law of one school teacher, I appreciate the work you do, Ms. Whitaker. Um, and uh, being, being the son-in-law of a firefighter, um, I appreciate what you do. And I appreciate the fact that oftentimes when we get into legislation like this, or we get into votes about public sector unionization and benefits, we always put forward the first responders and the teachers because that pulls the heartstrings as it ought to of our citizens. I'm not denigrating public employees that aren't first responders or school teachers, but you folks uh, are on the front lines doing things that some of us can't do or won't do, and we appreciate your efforts. Um, the comments that have been made today, the questions and the answers that have been given have been helpful. Um, one set of comments and um, indications that I heard, though, did cause me concern. Uh, we are not any other nation in the world. Can I make that clear? And I think many of us believe that. I hope all of us believe that. We are not any other nation in the world. There's an international community. But the United States of America is separate from any other nation in the world, and it ought to be. We started out as a nation that broke away from international <laughs> regulations on us that we would not accept. We fought a revolutionary war to be unique. And what was that uniqueness? Freedom. Personal liberty. We are endowed with certain inalienable rights given to us by our Creator, as the Declaration of Independence says, namely the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we're talking about liberty and the pursuit of happiness here in this discussion today. We're talking about the freedom to make choices, significant choices. I appreciate the sponsor of the bill pointing out that after the law was changed in Iowa, there's been a 95% recertification 
by people who had that choice and made that choice. There is, I don't think anyone on this side of the aisle, regardless of what has been said by some of our, our friends and colleagues on the other side, a few who indicated very clearly that we oppose unions and collective bargaining. No, we don't. I was a union member and benefited from my father being a union, union member and helping to organize steel, steel unions or steel uh, mills in Chicago. My working conditions were far better than his were because of what the union did. We're not against that. But we're saying there ought to be choice that free citizens in a free country, unique and separate from any other nation in the world that has the highest standard of living, is a manufacturing nation of the world, leads in every other way, and wants to continue. And I come from a state that still people say, you gotta be kidding, You're, is Michigan a right to work state? They can't believe that, and yet it is. And Michigan has more jobs coming back now, jobs that we lost before more security in the workforce, better pay. A middle class is coming back. Great cities like Detroit that are re-emerging as a result of freedom and choice. And that's what we're asking for, but I also state in this particular issue with public sector employees, it's different. I don't have tenure. I have to go to the ballot box every year. I have to recertify every year myself, because I'm a public servant, and public servants take on that role, whether it's in teaching and firefighting and in law enforcement or in doing the bureaucratic work that is necessary to run a system of government that meets the needs of people. But we are different. We want to make sure that our citizens, the taxpayers, are represented well and are given a chance and not simply run over by a political system that unionizes for that purpose and purpose alone and doesn't give the choice to their employees. So, Madam Chairperson, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to make this statement. But differences in state government are unique and beautiful things. That's the, that's the undergirding of this great democracy, a Republican form of democracy, a constitutional democracy. But started at the behest of the states so to denigrate the powers of the states and the rights of the states by taking those away that they give to us as the federal government, not the other way around, is the wrong way to go. Let's continue to communicate, to work together, but let's enforce the freedom that comes from individual states being laboratories of success or failure, but in the end, laboratories that ultimately produce better success. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize myself for the purpose of making my closing statement. Thank you again to all of the witnesses for your testimonies today. Today, we heard about the status of public sector collective bargaining and the legislative proposals which ensure state and local government employees can exercise this right. These bills create minimum standards for collective bargaining rights that all states must meet to secure public servants' right to collectively bargain. We heard from Ms. Whitaker how what the difference between not having a union and having one meant to her as a teacher and how these rights are now under attack in my state of Florida. We heard from Mr. Brewer on how collective bargaining protects the safety of both our first responders and the public at large. We will stand with both of them and with all public servants to assure that they have respect and dignity on the job. I was a teacher before the United Teachers of Dade was organized in Miami. And when it was organized, oh boy, what a difference did it make in my life and the life of my family. I had health care, not only for me, but my family, and a great middle class salary. We can't go back. We won't go back. And as our witnesses have made clear, Congress must pass the Public Service Freedom to Negotiate Act 
and the Public Safety Employer Employee Cooperation Act to protect public servants' rights to organize and collectively bargain. Once again, I thank the witnesses for being here, thank the audience for staying through this long hearing, and I thank my colleagues for a constructive health subcommittee hearing. If there is no further business without objection, the committee stands adjourned.